Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Events. I am Elizabeth. I'm the events coordinator at Gibson's Bookstore and I am very pleased to welcome back this time virtually Keith O'Brien. Keith, hello. Hello. We are joining uh, tonight to talk about Keith's new book recently out, Paradise Falls, The True History of an Environmental Disaster, which is available from Gibson's Bookstore. You can stop in and pick it up off our shelves, off our tables. You can order it on our website. You can call us. We are happy to mail you this book, hand it to you, get this book to you, however you like. Um, so Keith, we have a bit of an introduction here for you, which we have, um, let me, I, I printed it out so that I could, uh, read it properly, Keith O'Brien is an award-winning journalist and a New York Times bestselling author who has written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, Politico, and national public radio shows like All Things Considered and Morning Edition. His last book was called Fly Girls. We had you in the store for that. It was very well attended and that has continued to sell well for us. People still love this book in hardcover and paperback. It was named one of New York Times 100 notable books of 2018, and it told the story of a forgotten band of female pilots in the 1920s and 30s who fought for the right to fly in race planes. Publishers Weekly called Fly Girls fast-paced, meticulously listly researched history. USA Today called it exhilarating and cinematic, and the New York Times said O'Brien's prose reverberates with fiery crashes, then stings with the tragedy of lives lost in the cockpit pit and sometimes equally heartbreaking on the ground. Our Gibson's Bookstore customers agree it is quite excellent. Fly Girls, the Times added, is feminist history of the best kind. Now Keith is here to discuss his new book, Paradise Falls, which tells the human story behind one of the landmark environmental disasters in human his American history, the story of the mothers who fought to save their families in a place called Love Canal. The Chicago Review of Books calls Paradise Falls a must read. Science News calls it so gripping it could almost be a thriller. And in a starred review, Booklist says that Paradise Falls is a narrative resplendent with ordinary people who stood up against overwhelming odds. The text blisters with details of the hard work and outrage. Book clubs will spend hours discussing this one. We will spend just one. Please welcome Keith O'Brien. Keith, welcome to Gibson's Bookstore. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all who, who have come out here this evening. Come out. You're in your you're in your houses or your cars, your kitchens. Uh, I hope you're making a lovely dinner and uh, perhaps having a, a glass of wine or sitting on the couch. This is uh, this is exciting uh, and and very very um, mid to late pandemic of us to be doing this. Uh, I, I hope it's late pandemic. Anyway, you're joining me here in my office. Uh, which is actually uh, where I wrote the bulk of this book, right here actually at this desk. Uh, um, at times that bookshelf behind me looked a lot more disorganized than it does now. Uh, and, and, I, and I hesitate to show you the rest of the room, but I will show you that as usual, my, my loyal colleague, uh, the dog, uh, is here with me tonight. He's, he's right down there on the floor. Hawkeye, you wanna look up, buddy? Hawkeye, good boy. Anyway. Hawkeye's in the house uh, and at my side as usual. He, I think he thinks he, he gets some credit for this. So anyway, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, via Zoom. Uh, uh, we're gonna talk tonight about, you know, one of the uh, great environmental crises of the 20th century, um, what happened, how it emerged, why it still matters today. And we're gonna talk a lot about the ordinary uh, folks, the mothers mostly, who, who forced this story into the spotlight and almost by accident ended up changing the world. Uh, it is a story of resistance. It's a story of epic proportions. Uh, in the span of about two years, these mothers would go from being ignored, completely ignored by their local school board and superintendent to having the ear of Jimmy Carter in the White House. And, and, and they would find themselves staring down uh, one of the most powerful corporate executives in America at the time. Th that is really the, the story of, of Paradise Falls. Um, uh, but before we get into all that, I, I wanted to start with something smaller. I wanted to start with a, a small sort of behind the scenes moment uh, from my research, uh, from my reporting. 
I thought I would begin tonight with the story of a bird. One of my very first interviews that I did, uh, by phone actually, right, right here in this office, was with a woman named Luella Kenny. Uh, Luella was a mother of three boys in the 1970s who, with her husband Norman, had purchased a small house on the east side of Niagara Falls. Um, the house was a small red brick home uh, on 96th Street. And, and it was you know, a, a, a great place uh, for the Kennys to raise a family. Um, you know, th this house was located on the northern edge of a tidy grid of streets about six miles due east of, of the waterfalls, which we all know. Uh, the neighborhood was called La Salle. And, and though the houses there were small, uh, these were starter homes, single story ranchers, uh, it was a desirable place to live. Uh, you know, people here were really scraping their way to the middle class on factory workers' wages. Uh, it was a lot of young families and, and a lot of children. And the children liked to gather on a wide expanse of rectangular land right in the heart of this neighborhood uh, that the children simply called the playground. Now, you know, adults often wondered why this rectangular land was never fully developed or properly developed. Uh, but the children asked no questions uh, because for them, it was, it was almost magical. There was a school uh, right in the heart of this land. Uh, there were play structures, a slide, and, and on weekends and, and weekday afternoons, uh, their friends were there uh, all the time. Uh, you know, this sort of swath of land and this school were, were one of the reasons why people moved here in the first place. Uh, but the Kennys had a different reason. Um, their house was located just north of, of this rectangular land on 96th Street at an elbow turn in the road. It was like a modified cul-de-sac, uh, backed away from any kind of uh, street traffic. And it had a, a large backyard, much larger uh, than, than any uh, other home in the, in the neighborhood, really. Uh, that backed up into a, a confluence of three creeks uh, that gathered there. Um, you know, this, of course, is paradise for the three Kenny boys. Uh, in the summer, they sloshed in those creeks. In the winter, they skated on them. Uh, and then in, in 1978, uh, problems started to emerge. People began to learn about secrets that were buried in the ground right beneath that school and playground. Uh, one of the Kenny boys began to get sick uh, with a mysterious set of symptoms that uh, mystified uh, doctors. And Luella Kenny, being a mother, uh, did what mothers do. You know, she focused all of her attention on her son, her house, her yard, those creeks. Uh, Luella began to wonder what was in the water. You know, in the months ahead, Luella Kenny would find herself crouching down at the edge of those, those creeks, uh, keeping a, a journal, a log, you know, logging what she saw. Uh, you know, at times she would write, you know, water murky, oil slicks, deep orange color, uh, odor permeates uh, the air, odor permeates uh, the entire yard. You know, I know that because Luella saved that log uh, her whole life uh, in, until she shared it with me in late 2019. And, and, and that brings me back to the bird, uh, the story of the bird. You know, sometimes in, in reporting and in research, people tell you things that seem too fantastic, too alarming, uh, or too good to be true. And, and the bird story really is, is, is one of those stories for me. Uh, in her memory, Luella said, one day she was down at that creek. And, and, and she was there, she said on this day, with two scientists. And she turned away from the creek, she said, for just a moment to walk back to the house. And as she did, she told me, she heard the two scientists, the two men speaking in agitated voices, and she heard them uh, running up through the trees. She said that one of them asked her if he might be able to store something in her freezer. Because in that moment, a small songbird had landed at the edge of the creek and it had dipped its beak in the water, the water that Luella was increasingly 
convinced was contaminated, maybe even the source of her family's problems. And then the bird promptly fell over, it was dead. So that story is roughly 43 years old. And part of the challenge I faced in, in writing Paradise Falls was parsing fact from fiction, truth from lies, especially in a story where, where so many people obfuscated for, for so long. Uh, this required uh, over 130 hours uh, of interviews, uh, thousands of pages of documents, uh, some of which I had to obtain via freedom of information requests 42 years later. Uh, and, and when I received some of these documents, uh, they were still heavily redacted. Uh, and as I said, this was a book that I did uh, right, right here by and large in this office. And I did it uh, on the cusp of and in the teeth of uh, that lockdown pandemic of 2020, uh, which means that, you know, of course, at times I wondered uh, if I would ever actually finish. Uh, so so it, is, it is great to be here with Unite, even uh, virtually. And it is also, just to be honest, a, a total relief uh, that I'm here as well. So um, I'm not going to talk too long tonight, but I want to give you a foundation for the story, what we're talking about here. And then we'll open it up for a small little uh, online salon, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So, you know, many of you probably have been to Niagara Falls, uh, and, and when you think of it, you think of, you know, the waterfalls and the tourist district and uh, the honeymooners and the souvenirs. And if you're of a certain age like I am, you might think of Superman, the movie from the 1970s. But the real work of Niagara Falls actually happens just a couple miles upriver from those falls. Uh, the stretch of N the Niagara River right there is dotted uh, with chemical plants, or at least it was uh, in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, you know, DuPont was there, Union Carbide, Carborundum, and there was this uh, place called Hooker Chemical. You know, at points in the 20th century, Hooker Chemical was both the largest employer in town and the largest industrial taxpayer in town. Uh, the company truly, in many ways, kept the lights on, uh, financed uh, the snow plows in winter, uh, you know, uh, did good work uh, providing you know, people with the chemicals they needed for the rubber soles of their shoes or uh, the fire retardant uh, carpets and, and sofas in their homes. And it also um, donated a great deal of money to schools and uh, even local artists. Uh, but most importantly, uh, Hooker provided jobs. Hooker provided about 3,000 jobs, actually, at its peak. And if you were a man, in particular, if you were a, a white man, and, and it is worth noting that you did have to be a white man, uh, you could make it all the way to the top at Hooker Chemical in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, you could have uh, that corporate office uh, you could fly uh, on the corporate jet. And, and if you were really lucky, you could fly on that jet with the man who would acquire Hooker Chemical in 1968. Uh, he was one of the most accomplished and, and wealthiest uh, businessmen in, in America at the time with the most powerful lawyers. Uh, he was uh, the chairman of Occidental Petroleum. Uh, some of you may remember him. His name was Armand Hammer. But for all the good work that Hooker does, uh, the jobs it provides, the profits it generates, uh, the company also creates its fair share of trouble in town, at times uh, shocking troubles. You know, workers at that plant right there along the Niagara River uh, were injured, at times with alarming regularity. And, and, and neighbors near the plant suffered too, uh, sort of living at times in noxious fumes, clouds even, that, that wafted up or down the river. Uh, workers also died at the plant, again, at times with alarming regularity in explosions, chemical fires, uh, incidents that defied explanation. On at least two occasions, 
in the 1960s. Uh, the, the manhole covers on the street on Buffalo Avenue, right in front of the hooker plant, popped and blew. And these uh, manhole covers skittered uh, you know, across the road into oncoming traffic. And of course, you know, maybe most surprising were these secrets. Uh, secrets that people in power in Niagara Falls knew, not just at Hooker, but at the city, and, and, and that most other people did not. And these secrets were buried uh, in many places in Niagara Falls, but among them, that, that, that rectangular stretch of land right in the heart of that neighborhood on the east side of town, uh, Luella Kenny's uh, neighborhood. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, Hooker uh, dumped about 21,000 tons of chemical waste and residue uh, on that land, which was then an old abandoned canal that had been built or attempted to be built in the 1890s by a man named William T. Love, the Love Canal. And, 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 and they had acquired that, that land and, and used, used it for that purpose. Um, and, and according to my research, as early as 1946, Hooker knew it had problems out there. Um, in August 1946, according to internal documents uh, that I found, um, the, uh, the executives are going back and forth with one another, another, one another uh, worried, they said, that they've been using this land as a dump for some three years uh, without ownership or even permission. Um, but two days after that memo, uh, a corporate lawyer for Hooker uh, wrote another one, this time straight to the top executive. And, and he said that um, he was more worried about a different issue, uh, something more troublesome he thought than just permission. Uh, he wasn't a scientist, he was just a lawyer but he'd been to the site, he'd seen it with his own eyes, and he was convinced that it was contaminated. And, and in fact, not just that, he had seen children uh, wandering up to the edge of, of what they thought was still a canal with their quote, bathing costumes in their hands. And, and given this, uh, the lawyer said, uh, he had to conclude that they were running a quote, real hazard there on the east side of town. Um, you know, uh, it, these hazards only grew in, in the years to come, uh, you know, uh, as, as more and more people pushed east out of town in those post, post-war boom years in Niagara Falls. Uh, you know, the population base uh, began to move east, and of course, more and more chemicals were in the ground by the early 1950s. And I thought I'd just mention a, a few of them now. Uh, uh, one of these uh, chemicals was something called thionyl chloride, which is something that uh, means nothing to most of us. Uh, it was a um, sort of pale yellow liquid with a veritable, very irritable odor. Um, and, and while most people don't know what it is, uh, you will recognize what it was used for. Thionyl chloride is one of the fundamental elements uh, of, of mustard gas, uh, which Hooker produced in great volumes uh, especially for World War I. Uh, there was also something called lindane, which is a white powdery substance, which is a, an element used in many pesticides. Uh, and there was something called 12345 uh, tetrachlora benzene, uh, which again, isn't something that most people know, but it, it too was a fundamental element of pesticides. Uh, it was um, insoluble in water. Uh, and it was known to spawn a particularly uh, troublesome uh, byproduct uh, that might ring a bell for some of you. Uh, it was known to uh, spawn dioxin, uh, which among other things uh, was the fundamental element of Agent Orange, uh, the, uh, uh, the defoliant used uh, during uh, the Vietnam War. So, you know, by the spring of 1952, uh, with the population moving east and, and many of these chemicals in the ground there. Uh, the Board of Education in the city of Niagara Falls approached Hooker with an offer. Uh, they said they wanted to buy that land and use it as a school. And, you know, initially Hooker is uh, dismissive of this idea, as they will say, this is not suitable 
for that purpose. Uh, but the Board of Education persists. They want the land. They need a place to build a school. Uh, and over the course of that spring, again, in internal memos, uh, the tone at Hooker begins to change. Uh, they begin to wonder if maybe they could uh, maybe transfer this property to the Board of Education. As, as one uh, lawyer will note that spring, the Love Canal property, he said, is, quote, rapidly becoming a, a liability. Uh, and so despite their own misgivings and despite telling uh, the school uh, board again and again that this really isn't the best use of this land, uh, they do transfer the property uh, to the city of Niagara Falls uh, for a dollar and up goes that school and around it grows that neighborhood, uh, Luella Kenny's neighborhood. And I think it's important to, to say that the problems began almost immediately. Um, you know, children were burned uh, on that playground with burns on their skin, burns in their eyes. Uh, at times, fires broke out on that land. On, on at least one occasion, a buried drum of thionyl chloride uh, burst and exploded on a quiet uh, morning, uh, scattering its contents over, over nearby houses. Uh, and, and, and perhaps most alarming to me, uh, uh, children reported something that became almost a legend. Uh, they said that rocks uh, in this area uh, would spontaneously combust, would catch fire. Now, again, this is something that seems is, is so absurd as to be ridiculous. There's no way that could ever happen. And, and I certainly thought that. Uh, but in every interview I did with children, now grown adults in their 50s and 60s, who grew up at that land, and in this neighborhood in the 1960s and 70s, every single one of these uh, adults, then children, reported seeing the fire rocks. And then one day in the microfilm in Western New York, going through old newspapers, uh, I found a story uh, from March 1966. And uh, the headline of the story was something like, uh, residents alerted uh, to hazard. And it was a very small story. Uh, and the story said that a school principal had informed the city uh, that children were reporting finding rocks that would burst into flames. And in fact, he said that one of these children, uh, a boy, had had a rock in his pants pocket when it did catch fire. And as a result, uh, Ernest Gedeon, then the uh, top health official uh, for the city of Niagara Falls, uh, said that he was concerned. He was concerned, he said, about the fire hazard. And, and Ernest Gideon's uh, advice wa was uh, as follows. Uh, he said that any child who, who finds uh, this material, this flammable material or rocks, uh, should immediately submerge it in water or bury it in the ground. You know, and this struck me as quite interesting because I have two boys who are now 12 and 14 years old. I can assure you that if they found rocks out there uh, in, in my land or, or the, the, the forest around me that uh, could burst into flames, they would think it was the greatest thing they had ever found. And I guarantee you they would not be submerging it in water or burying it underground. You know, so, so you know, this is the world uh, you know, that, that, that Luella, Kenny and others are living in, uh, in, in 1977, when these problems really begin to emerge in ways never seen before. And, and, and that's when uh, my characters, uh, the characters in Paradise Falls, uh, really begin to fight back. And, you know, I, I thought I, I would um, maybe just introduce you to a couple of them briefly, uh, little sketches, and, and then I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Um, uh, one, of, one of the characters in this book is a woman named Bonnie Casper. Uh, Bonnie uh, was a 28-year-old congressional aide uh, for uh, the congressman from Niagara Falls, a man named John LaFalse. Uh, and in 1977, John LaFalse had actually only been in office for a couple of years, uh, but he would go on to serve the city of Niagara Falls for three decades. Uh, and Bonnie is uh, one of his aides in Washington. 
And she has taken that job in the way that many aides do. Uh, Bonnie has come to Washington to change the world. You know, very idealistic visions of what she can accomplish. And in June 1977, Bonnie Casper, who's all of 100 pounds, five foot two, gets a call um, from a small time bureaucrat in Niagara Falls. And he says that he wants to meet with Bonnie in Washington because he's hoping that maybe he and John the False can help them get some money, a lot of money, about $400,000 to study a problem on the east side of town. And he flies to Washington and explains this problem in depth. He says that rusted drums are surfacing on this old playground and, and they don't know what to do about it. And, you know, I did a, a lot of interviews for this book, obviously, uh, with people who are still alive. One of the people I tracked down first was John LaFalls, the congressman from Niagara Falls. And um, I did lengthy interviews with, with Congressman LaFalls, the former congressman. And, and he said at one point, you know who you really need to find is Bonnie Casper. And, and, and John helped, helped me do that. He helped connect me with Bonnie. And, and I, I, I flew to meet her uh, in late uh, 2019, early 2020, just before the pandemic. And um, Bonnie is not in politics anymore. She's a, a real estate agent in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and, I, and I met her at her office there, her real estate office. And, and she told me before I came, she said, you know, I kept some documents. Uh, I'll bring them to the office. And I said, well, that'd be fantastic. And I get to the office there and we go to a small conference room and Bonnie Casper has lined up file after file and box after box of documents. And, and I've clearly underestimated how much she has. And, and she said, well, of course I have a lot. And of course I kept a lot because I was there at the beginning. And you know, I realized right away, I wasn't gonna be able to go through her documents in the time I had. And so I uh, asked if I could bring it home. I was flying back to New Hampshire that day. And I um, uh, took the boxes with me, but in order to get on the plane, I actually had to go buy a piece of luggage. And I brought those documents back here to this office and they were, they were crucial in, in, in rebuilding this story. Um, another uh, person who is crucial to this story uh, is a, a woman named Beverly Pagan. Uh, Beverly was not a resident of the neighborhood. Uh, she lived about 25 minutes away in Buffalo. Um, she had no mortgage to lose, no kids in danger. Uh, you know, but Beverly was a mother uh, and, and she was a PhD level biologist in Buffalo who had spent the last several years focusing her attention and her research on a nascent idea. Uh, Beverly was studying the link between uh, environment, uh, environmental hazards like pollution and smog uh, to our health. And indeed, Beverly had done an early study, a couple early studies, in which she made a link, then controversial, uh, between cigarette smoking and cancer. So Beverly, of course, wants to go out and investigate what's happening in this neighborhood in, in Niagara Falls. And she goes there in the summer of 1978, and she begins assisting the residents, you know, running her own studies. And Beverly quickly comes to the conclusion that she believes the risks extend far greater than what state officials and federal officials are saying at the time. And, and she uh, begins to state these uh, concerns she has first privately and then publicly. And this poses a problem for Beverly because, you know, she worked for a place in Buffalo called Roswell Park, which was affiliated with the university at Buffalo, a state university, and in fact was under the umbrella of the New York State Department of Health. And so effectively, Beverly Pagan was an employee of the state and the Department of Health. And so when she begins to make her public statements uh, that she thinks the threat is far greater than the government is saying, uh, she really puts her job on the line and she knows she's doing that at the time. Um, and I did also track down Beverly Pagan. Um, she was in her early 80s when I found her in late 2019. And I spent two days uh, interviewing her at her home in Maine uh, where she spent the last 30 years, uh, about four hours north of me in a place some of you might have visited 
Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, which is of course where Acadia National Park is located. And uh, you know, when I went to Beverly's house, we of course uh, talked at length and Beverly also said that she had records that she wanted to share. Uh, as she said to me uh, upon my first visit, I have a lot, uh, an entire file cabinet, maybe four drawers and more boxes in storage. And, and those were incredibly useful to me. Uh, but just as useful, if not more so, uh, were records I found about Beverly somewhere else. Um, you know, when you do a project like this and you go to an archive, uh, you're searching for very specific things, uh, but you'll also just do blanket searches for everything or everybody you might be writing about. And um, in early research visits in 2019 and 2020, I went to the State Archives of New York in Albany. And, um, you know, there are thousands of pages related to Love Canal there. Um, and and, and I, I searched for everything else I was writing about. And I can tell you that, you know, the State Archives in New York does not have a file on everybody who's ever worked for the state of New York, uh, because that would be millions upon millions of files. Uh, but when I did a search, I did find a file for Beverly Pagan. And I attempted to request that, but I was denied. I was told that was a private file. And so I had to file a freedom of information request. And I had to wait about 10 months to get those records back. Um, you know, Beverly long believed that she was being followed during 1978, 79, and 80. She thought people were listening in on our calls. She thought they were even opening her mail. Uh, in the records that I got from the state of New York, I did not find evidence of that. But what I can say, having seen these records now, 330 pages of previously shielded documents, is that they were watching her. Powerful men in Albany all the way to the doorstep of the governor of New York, wanted to know uh, what Beverly with Pagan was saying and to whom uh, they wanted to know what she was saying. So, so there's Bonnie Casper, there's Beverly Pagan, uh, there's a woman named Lois Gibbs, uh, who uh, more than any other uh, person in this story will force this story into the spotlight. Uh, Lois Gibbs uh, was a mother of two children uh, on 101st Street. This is two blocks to the east of, of that playground and that school. Uh, and and uh, Lois uh, had purchased that house with her husband on his factory worker's wages um, because of its proximity to the school, because of the families in the neighborhood. And, you know, Lois was what they would have called at the, at the time a housewife, uh, a stay-at-home mom. Um, you know, she had in fact barely graduated from high school. And Lois was very self-conscious about her lack of education. Uh, and in fact, she said that she wouldn't even speak up at PTA meetings or teacher conferences. Um, but when Lois uh, learns about what's happening in the neighborhood, she begins to connect it to problems in her own life. Um, you know, within just a couple of months of her oldest son attending kindergarten at that school, at that playground, uh, he begins to suffer from seizures. And, and, and Lois, connecting dots now, a small story she's reading in the newspaper, um, begins to uh, wonder if maybe those chemicals might be what's affecting her son, what's causing these seizures. And she does at that point what many parents would do. She takes her concerns to the school district and she makes a modest request. Um, she asks simply that uh, her son be moved to a different school uh, that fall. And, um, you know, I often wonder how history might be different had they satisfied that request, but they do not. Uh, uh, they say the school is safe. And Lois becomes furious and begins to go door to door in this community, gathering signatures, uh, initially anyway, just to shut down the school. Uh, and she's stunned uh, in the summer of 1978, when not only do they decide to shut down that school, but uh, recommend and then actually order the evacuation of 200 people living right around it. Uh, but Lois Gibbs lives just outside that evacuation zone and she will spend the next two years almost fighting to escape her own home. And, and more than anyone else, Lois will uh, you know, uh, get the attention of top officials in this country, including 
President Jimmy Carter. Uh, indeed, uh, Jimmy Carter will personally at one point invite Lois Gibbs on stage and thank her for everything she's done. And then finally, there's uh, that woman, Luella Kenny, that I mentioned at the outset. And it's Luella Kenny who will stare down Arm and Hammer, uh, that powerful executive. She will be a mother of, of three boys, you know, taking him on. And, you know, that was, as things go, relatively easy to confirm. Uh, there were news stories written about uh, Luella's confrontation with uh, Arm and Hammer. Uh, there were multiple witnesses to it that I could interview. And in fact, there was a transcript that I actually found uh, at, at all places, uh, Columbia University. Uh, and so that I could reconstruct. But the bird story was more difficult. Um, you know, on uh, research trips to Niagara Falls, Buffalo, Albany, State Archives, National Archives in Washington, D.C., I found nothing about it. Uh, and then one day I was uh, here in New England. I was in Boston, uh, just north of Boston at Tufts University. And I was going through Lois Gibbs's papers. Uh, as some of you know, your papers are essentially everything you kept, uh, you know, your letters, your memos mail you received, mail you sent out, journals, notes, whatever. And, and, and so, of course, I want to go through Lois Gibbs's papers. And they were voluminous. And in them, I found two files, very thick files, uh, labeled daily status updates, daily reports. These were reports written by a man named Stephen Lester. Stephen was a scientist who was a consultant to the residents. Uh, of the neighborhood. Stephen was hired by the state of New York to be a third party consultant to the residents because the residents increasingly did not trust state scientists. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Stephen's writing these reports effectively to prove to the state that he's doing his job. In fact, at the top of each uh, report, it says work voucher daily report. Uh, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I, I start reading these uh, and, and, and there's a couple hundred of them. And, and sometimes they're three or four pages in length uh, and with written in dense scientific language uh, with chemical readings and uh, engineering sketches, you know, not, not the most uh, interesting reading. Um, but for me, it was, it was gold because this was a timestamp, you know, written, by a third party, an objective party, who was in the room, Stephen Lester was at the table, and, and, and just as important, he had recorded it in real time. Stephen had written these reports at the end of each day. Uh, so, so in late 2019 and early 2020, I'm reading his reports. Uh, I'm scanning them all with my phone. I'm um, you know, glazing over at times, you know, wondering, what am I doing here deep in the library at Tufts reading these reports? And, and then, you know, I get to the spring of 1979. And, and, and uh, uh, in the spring of 79, uh, Stephen begins to write that he is visiting homes in the neighborhood. And he's visiting homes, he said, with a second scientist running tests. And this, of course, is familiar to me, right? because Luella had mentioned two scientists. And, and here's Stephen out visiting homes uh, with a second scientist. So I begin reading more closely. And I, I get to June 1979, June 7th, actually, 1979. And um, on this day, Stephen reports that, um, uh, he, he starts his report by his, logging his hours. You know, he, he, he says that he works that day from, nine to five thirty, And in the opening lines of his report there on June 7th, he says that uh, they're doing remediation at the canal site, they're cutting down trees, they're putting up a fence. Uh, and then he reports that on this day, he has gone out to visit a number of homes in the neighborhood uh, with a second scientist. And these two men have visited a home on 96th Street, 1064 96th Street the home of Mrs. Kinney, he says. He spells her name K-I-N-N-E-Y, not K-E-N-N-Y, uh, because of course, 
Stephen Lester does not know Luella Kenny, but everything else he gets right. He says that he and the other scientists go down the, to the creek and, 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 and he notes the contaminated smell of the creeks uh, and the contaminated colors of the creeks, the, the orange appearance. He says in his notes that uh, this water is clearly troubled. And then, you know, down at the bottom of the page, uh, in a file containing hundreds of pages, in uh, a collection containing thousands of documents, in this small room at Tufts University, Stephen Lester uh, writes something that stops me. He says that while we were visiting her home and the creeks, a small bird which was feeding in the water collapsed and died. And in that moment, I knew a few things. I knew that Luella Kenny was telling the truth about the bird. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I knew that Bonnie Casper and Beverly Pagan and Lois Gibbs were probably telling the truth too. You know, I just needed to keep doing the work, uh, keep doing interviews and finding documents. You know, I was all alone in that archive, but I, but I was on the right path. And, and I wanna thank you for listening to me uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions you all might have. This was an amazing story um, and horrifying. Uh, as myself, a mother, I, no, I don't like that. I don't like that, that one bit. Um, I can con also confirm that my own chaos children would definitely not be submerging a spontaneously combusting rock in the water or burying it, there would be many science experiments and there would be many explosions. Um, and I, you know, even though the housing market right now is uh, pretty fierce, I feel like no spontaneous combustions is one of the base considerations for what I want in my neighborhood. So it's really shocking how long this went on. Um, I suppose it, it shouldn't be shocking um, because of, of money. Um, because of the financial and economic considerations of the people who wanted it not brought to light. Um, and that is, in a different way, also extremely upsetting. Um, we have several audience questions that we can leap right into. I do want to remind our audience, if you um, are in our audience or are watching later, uh, Paradise Falls is available from Gibson's Bookstore. Keith has promised if you can uh, wait a few days, if you put in your order that you're happy to wait a few days, he's traveling right now um, or, or will not be able to make it to Gibson's for a few days. But if you're okay waiting a week or so, he'll come in and sign it for you. Um, and it is available from Gibson's Bookstore. Um, so let's start in on some of these questions because we've got some really great ones here. Let me pop up into our audience here. And let's see, government, there was one about government funds here and super funds. Where does the federal government bring the materials from Superfund sites? Perhaps you can explain uh, to some of us what Superfund sites are. So um, as some of you will recognize that term Superfund, uh, it, it, and, and uh, Love Canal is essentially the first Superfund site. Uh, it is the, uh, the place where this uh, idea was born. Um, in the fall of 78, as these problems emerge in Niagara Falls and uh, as the EPA and, and government officials begin to wrestle with them, the EPA is well aware that it has a problem that uh, of these orphaned sites, you know, hazardous sites that were put in the ground decades and decades earlier, because as some of you know, the EPA wasn't even founded until 1970. Uh, so, you know, it was not around to police these issues in the 40s and 50s, both in Niagara Falls and elsewhere. So the, the EPA is aware it has a problem. It does a quick count. It determines there's as many as 600 different, uh, you know, uh, orphaned hazardous waste sites around the country. And, and it begins to discuss uh, sweeping legislation uh, that would give it authority and also funding uh, to clean up the sites. Uh, it, it, they, they said it would need to be a large fund or as they started to say, a super fund, which is how uh, the term was born. And the premise at the time was that the polluter would pay. 
Um, there were taxes that were, were baked into the process uh, to industrial um, uh, companies, uh, petro petroleum companies, petrochemical companies, uh, and, and chemical manufacturers that everybody paid up front. And that way, when these problems emerged, uh, the government would have the ability to come in quickly and, and clean up the site and remediate the site. In some ways, that's still the case today. However, um, in the last uh, 27 years, uh, many of these fundamental taxes and this core philosophy of the polluter pays has been stripped out of the Superfund legislation. Uh, it started in 1995. Uh, when uh, the uh, Republican-led Congress, the Newt Gingrich-led Congress, let those taxes lapse. And, and just in the past several months under the Biden administration, um, uh, some of those have been reinstated, but others still aren't there. And, you know, the reason why that matters to, to people like us, to everyday taxpayers is, Regardless of whether the companies pay those taxes, uh, the Superfund is being funded uh, in order to clean up the next disaster. And so if the companies aren't paying it, it's coming essentially from our tax uh, dollars, which means that our tax dollars aren't being used for something else. Uh, and, and so uh, while this is the beginning of the Superfund and while the Superfund uh, uh, legislation has been very successful in cleaning up hundreds of sites. Uh, it is not nearly as powerful today uh, as it used to be. Uh, from the same audience member, they ask, how do the laws work in terms of what get cleans up, gets cleaned up and what doesn't? For example, in Concord, New Hampshire, the gas holder building has petroleum underground. At the new apartments at the old tannery site, I believe there are still some hides underground while others were taken away. And if that's the tannery site I'm thinking of in Penacook, that has been there for about 30, 20, 30 years, not cleaned up until very recently. Um, it's been sitting there. Um, in this case, the the polluters are the tannery went out of business. So they weren't there to help fund the cleanup? Who, who chooses? So that's a great question. Uh, and it's almost, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I hate to disappoint the, 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 the reader with these great questions, but there are hundreds of sites right now that are on the priority list uh, for the EPA and the Superfund cleanups. And there is obviously a limited number of uh, a limited amount of funding and a limited amount of, of, uh, of crews to do this kind of work. And so um, it's almost uh, like a get in line kind of situation. Uh, now, when there are uh, pressing crises, say like a love canal situation, right? In the heart of a neighborhood affecting children, those kind of uh, sites can leapfrog others on the list. Uh, but now we're getting into politics and we're getting into, you know, congressional weight and, uh, you know, what Congress person or senator wants the site cleaned up in his or her district or his or her state. And, you know, it does, it does get political at times. But the bottom line is the list is long. And sadly, there are still quite a number of sites in this country that need remediation. Uh, you mentioned the politics of who gets to pick what. Um, Deborah says it's still happening. Research Aberdeen, uh, North Carolina Elementary School built on a Superfund site. Pestis pesticide disposal dump. Why did they build there? Because the land was cheap. The majority of the students are persons of color. Um, and th that's a great that's a great point that I want to say something about. Um, you know, in some states, there's uh, as many as almost. Uh, uh, 40 or 50 percent of residents live within a, a three mile radius of a Superfund site. Uh, for example, in New Jersey, uh, that's the case. But in some other states like New York, almost a third of residents live within three miles of a Superfund site. You can get off this Zoom tonight and go online and search it yourself and see how close you are to one. But to the point you just mentioned, if you are a person of color, or if you are uh, 
a person of challenged socioeconomic status, regardless of your color, the chances are exponentially higher that you live closer to one of these sites because as you just said, uh, the land is cheaper and even, uh, even after it's been remediated. And so that creates, uh, you know, sort of a, 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 a sort of tainted reputation of the site uh, that leaves its uses limited. All right, when Love Canal was cleaned up, were they able to extract anything? And also, where does the government bring the cleaned up materials? Some cleaned up materials are processed. Other cleaned up material or remediated materials are, are buried in other more contained landfills. Um, again, the fact is uh, the human population is creating material, whether it's hazardous waste or regular waste, that as we all know, needs to go somewhere. And so uh, some, some waste is buried uh, in, in contained, modern, uh, essentially holding landfills. Um, uh, but it, this too is a problem. You know, where the waste goes uh, once it's cleaned up uh, is, is an issue. And it was political and, and troubling to New Yorkers, Western New Yorkers in the 1970s as well. Uh, everybody wanted to know where, where the Love Canal waste was going, and and some of it was, uh, you know, uh, buried elsewhere, um, and 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 to your to your the first part of your question though was was it all remediated? The answer is no. Um, some Superfund sites uh, are able to be cleaned up and utilized for positive things: uh, public tennis courts, golf courses, greenways. Uh, sometimes these are old Superfund sites. And um, you know there are no lingering uh, effects uh, in in Niagara Falls with Love Canal. Uh, that is not the case. Um, in 1988, uh, about 10 years after my story ends, eight years after my story ends, the state of New York uh, did a massive study, uh, one that um, scarcely any other state had ever taken on before. And, and they uh, analyzed the land all around this old canal, which at that point was now almost completely evacuated, a thousand families gone, uh, except for a few holdouts who refused to leave. And uh, they determined that the homes on the um, downtown side uh, of the old canal and the northern side of the canal, that, that stretch of land on the northern side where Luella Kenny lived, they determined that the, there were no elevated risks there and that those homes could be resold and resettled. And they were. Uh, and so if you drive in today uh, to the neighborhood, if you drive out of downtown Niagara Falls east to the edge of town and you drive into what was used to be called LaSalle and what is now always referred to as Love Canal, um, you will see Streets just really how they used to look. Small little starter homes, families. Luella Kenny's house is still there. Uh, but when you um, move to the eastern side of the canal, uh, 99th Street, 100th Street, 101st, 102nd, 103rd, all the way to the edge of town, uh, those streets are empty. And uh, the houses are gone. Uh, the few houses that remain uh, that were occupied by people who refused to leave are, are really falling apart now. Some are crumbling in and collapsing in on themselves. Uh, the pavement is buckled, the streets are cracked. Uh, you know, it's, it's a wasteland. And that canal itself, um, that rectangular swath of land is fenced off from the world. Uh, it is uh, uh, monitored 24 seven uh, for for uh, chemical releases. Wow. Um, so we are almost at the end of our hour here. We have time for just a few more questions, which I've, I've got pulled up here. Someone asks, in the beginning, when the city and the school board was trying to get this land, did they threaten to take the land by eminent domain? Or was it just pure divesting of liabilities? They did threaten uh, condemnation of the land, according to Hooker. Um, 
this is uh, something that Hooker mentioned specifically uh, four years after it sold the land uh, to the city. So in 53, it transfers the land for a dollar. And in 57, problems are already developing there at the land. And uh, at that point, uh, Hooker informs uh, the district that, you know, they, they had been concerned about these problems. And it mentions in this letter, you know, that you had threatened condemnation. And, you know, I want to be very clear here. And, and, and I think the book makes this very clear. This problem, these problems in, in this neighborhood were not the result of one decision, uh, you know, one mistake, uh, you know, one choice, but the choices and, and decisions and mistakes that were made again and again and again uh, for years and even decades. And, and, and the book makes clear these were made by multiple parties. Effectively, everyone in power in Niagara Falls, um, at, you know, from the top of Hooker Chemical to uh, other companies, to the city itself, to the schools, to the principal of that school, knew what they were dealing with. Everybody knew. The people who didn't know were the ordinary folks. And, you know, you know, Hooker argued uh, when these problems emerged in the 70s that it had warned the, the district to these problems. It had predicted this would happen and it specifically blamed construction in this neighborhood. The school, the roads, some roads did crisscross later right across this land. And they argued that these uh, decisions to build had created the problem. I think there are, that's a valid argument, uh, you know, absolutely a valid argument. However, uh, Hooker was an extremely powerful company and uh, it carried weight in this city uh, just as great, if not more so than most politicians. And, uh, you know, I think, that the record shows that it could have stood up more forcefully uh, way back in 1952 and 53 and, and said with absolute conviction that you cannot build here and it will end poorly. And, and, and even after they, they sold this land, um, time and again, when, the, when there were problems, the city would call Hooker to come help them deal with it. Uh, but nobody alerted the residents. Nobody told people as they bought these homes or sent this, these children to this school that this was the land uh, that this entire property was sitting on. And I think that is, um, again, uh, not just a hooker issue, but a city issue, a government issue. Uh, it's an issue of people in power keeping information from people who do not have power. Um, that's, yeah, that's a rousing, I have no words for that because it's, it's, you see it still today, people in power and, and the politicians making choices and the average person getting stuck with the bill. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking. This is an amazing book that you've written. I will end with one last question. Why did you call the book Paradise Falls instead of Niagara Falls or Love Canal? Uh, well, I don't think the, the title Niagara Falls is, is, is a very uh, evocative one. Uh, Love Canal could be a title, uh, but I didn't like that for a couple reasons. One, um, if you are of a certain age, uh, that immediately um, uh, creates a certain image in your head, um, which maybe isn't actually what this book is about. Uh, and so I think it instantly um, creates an image that maybe isn't what the heart of the story is. Uh, and if you're younger, uh, you know, if, if you're say under the age of 40 or 42 years old, you don't even know what that is very likely. And, and so the phrase love canal is, is just sort of odd um, for someone who doesn't know what this is. And so um, it's funny, uh, you know, you, you write a book that's like a hundred thousand words long, and then you do spend lots and lots of time 
uh, hashing out two or four or five words that your title is going to be. So a lot of thought does go into it. And to me, uh, the, the name Paradise Falls is evocative. Uh, it, it captures the idea that this was a paradise because it was. Uh, and, I, and I think for those of you who do read the book, you'll see that, you know, uh, I start the story where it would have started for the residents, which is before the problems and you feel them coming. Uh, and, and then of course, there's that sort of double entendre, that double meaning uh, it's paradise falls and sometimes, you know, paradise falls. An excellent answer. And the person who asks says, this makes sense. This makes a lot of sense. So well done, excellent choice. Paradise Falls is available from Gibson's Bookstore. If you're willing to wait a week or so, we'll get it signed for you. And we are happy to ship. See you in store. Keith, this has been a great presentation. Thank you so much for returning to us for this. This has been amazing. You give such a great presentation. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you all for, for, for joining me here in my office here on a, on a Monday night. I really appreciate it, everybody. And um, everybody have a great night. Have a great night, everyone.